watching the movie being discussed in this episode prior to engaging with the episode itself would be a worthy assist to you. Okay, so... Welcome in. If you haven't seen this, you probably shouldn't be here, but with that said, let's review Hell or High Water. Um, spoilers? Hell or High Water is a modern-day telling of the story we know, Cops and Robbers. You know, usually that's attributed to, like, the old westerns, and this is that. But what got me to watch it is the fact that it's a modern-day western with today's technology, today's weaponry. That right there was the most intriguing part. So these are two bank robbers who are also brothers, and then there's a sheriff that's put in charge of catching them, chasing them down, and he's just days from retirement. This is one of those heartbreaking movies where you're rooting for both parties, the good and the bad, because their reasons for doing what they're doing aren't bad in and of themselves. The, the bank robbers are robbing to pay off their mother's mortgage on their house. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a Robin Hood type of situation there. But simply because the sheriff or the good guy is the good guy, we, we understand that he needs to win for the story. Similar to the plot of Warrior. If you haven't seen that movie, I... Well, I'm going to be reviewing it soon. <coughs> you want Tom Hardy in that movie Warrior to win the UFC championship for his reasons for fighting and, and getting all that money. But then you want his brother, who is going up against Joel Edgerton, to win just as much for his reasons that he's going in and fighting for this money. The emotional element is so vibrant in Warrior, and, and it's the same exact theme, thing here. It's supposed to keep you engaged. The filmmakers did the same thing here. Written by Taylor Sheridan, who then wrote and directed Wind River right after this, which is just as compelling. Almost just as compelling. Side note, I just started watching Yellowstone. I had no idea that Taylor Sheridan, who dates back to Sons of Anarchy, he, he co-created that show, and then he wrote Hell or High Water, he wrote and directed Wind River, and then he co-created, wrote and directed, and acts in Yellowstone. And I love that he's doing that. He is representing modern-day Texans today. They kind of hold him in that, to that acclaim of, like, this guy is putting a voice to what Texans are going through now, not what they were going through in the late 1800s, like what John Wayne was portraying in his movies. That's not this movie. That's, this is today. Taylor Sheridan has said, I only make movies to fund my horse habit. Like, how much I love horses. There's a part in Yellowstone where they're auctioning auctioning off a bunch of horses and all the details that Taylor is saying his character he's actually playing the guy who's doing the auction he's like listing all these details pros and cons of this horse or that horse and I was like oh that he didn't even have to research any of that he just knows it Jeff Bridges Chris Pine and Ben Foster star in this movie Hell or High Water when I found that out I mean bro you can't get a better trio this movie is like a uh, total love story to old westerns. You know, I grew up watching Silverado, Quigley Down Under, Maverick, and a couple other, I guess you would call those kind of parody westerns. They're not really westerns. Each one, I don't know, each one kind of has a parody aspect to it, but I don't totally consider those real westerns. I'm not even sure that I enjoy real westerns. Unforgiven is totally an exception. I love that movie. True Grit, also starring Jeff Bridges. That's a, that's another great one. That's a remake of a John Wayne movie made by the Coen brothers and set, set back in the day. It's not modern day at all. But the modern day telling of old adages, stories, and myths has always caught my attention. I love it. Like, I made a movie with my brother called Cain and Abel, which is like a modern day telling of Cain and Abel. And I just love old stories set way back when being placed in today. I love thinking about the process they go through in translating it all to now. Chris Pine plays the younger brother to Ben Foster. He is incredibly loyal to his older brother and dedicated to keeping him out of trouble. Even though the Robin Banks, Chris Pine, is, his character is definitely going to fall on the sword for his brother at any given point. He's a family man down on his luck with a keen way of pulling off bank heists. And he just wants this one last job to set them up for life. It's actually not really a last job, it's a last run. 
where they're just touring. They're just going across the states. Or maybe it's just cities. Maybe ju they're just going from city to city, town to town, robbing these little banks. And Jeff Bridges is smart enough to sit there, plant himself in one town, and just go, they're coming here next. And, he, and he's right. Chris Pine, uh, Toby Howard is, is the character that he's playing. He's smart, non-violent, or bluffing when executing their bank robberies. He doesn't intend on anybody getting hurt. Banking, a thing what I did there, banking on the fact that he, that the people he's threatening would have no way of knowing if he's actually bluffing or not, or if he's really gonna hurt them. The threat of being hurt allows for the innocent people to comply. Ben Foster, who has quickly become one of my favorite actors to watch. Ever since I saw him in Rampart, he played a homeless man. I, I've never seen a homeless person be so authentically portrayed in a movie like this, like this guy did. So he's the older brother, Tanner Howard. There's Toby and Tanner, this guy's Tanner. He's chaotic in nature, loves to party, get drunk, be reckless. With, without his brother watching out for him, Tanner would not have lived as far as he has so far. Which is ironic, considering what happens at the end. <laughs> he is perfectly okay with people getting hurt in the heists that he pulls off with his brother. He's 39 years old, spent 10 years in jail, and, and more on that later. Very violent past. He gets woken up one time and flips out and start, starts attacking his brother. And he's like, uh, oh, good morning. Once he realizes there's no threat. Jeff Bridges. He is about to retire, like I said. He lands one more job, and it ends up being one of the bigger jobs of his whole career. He's tired, sick of chasing these young fools. He's on their heels and executes the job that he was sent out to do. He puts a stop to their running. He has a very old-fashioned way of getting the job done, and he knows exactly what he's doing. But he needs a partner there and as an aide because he's, he, physically he, he can't pull off what he's trying to do, the job that he's meant to do. He can't do it alone, even though he believes he could. That's the old, uh, the old set in his ways, you know, type of character that he's that he's playing. He's also super grumpy and a little racist, and often reminds me of when my when my grandpa gets upset. Like when he gets upset, the tone of voice that he takes reminds me of my grandpa when he gets upset. Gil Birmingham, who is in every single one of uh, Taylor Sheridan's projects, I've seen him in everything since Hell or High Water. He's been in all this stuff. He plays Alberto. Alberto is the sheriff's partner deputy, and he falls victim to a lot of the sheriff's racism towards Native Americans, because he is. He puts up with the offhanded remarks, and he stands his ground. He doesn't let it affect him. Ultimately, he earns the sheriff's respect through his, his actions and his sacrifice. He's as determined to get the job done as the sheriff, with a pure heart and strive to protect the innocent. This this all takes place in West Texas. We open up on the on the two brothers pulling off a bank right right when they open, and they rob it using a poor middle-aged woman uh, to open and un unlock the doors and the safe. Tanner, the chaotic brother, the older brother, him being so offended by the lady calling him stupid is so funny to me. He makes a whole big scene and threatens her, all because she called him stupid. And then at the end of the heist, he he calms down and he goes. You're stupid. <laughs> we learn early in the movie that planning and doing are two different things. That speaks to the theme of the movie this whole time. Their second job that we see, an old man carrying a gun inside the bank too. And he chases them out just unloading a six shooter on them. That's a pretty cool um, scene and very accurate to what Texans are capable of. I heard that there was a guy who went into a church just unloading unloading a, a, you know, AK-47 or something like that, AK AR-15. And like 17 Texans whipped out their guns and took them down. <laughs> Which that's not funny, but it's cool. It is actually awesome. That's what, that's why people carry guns, is to put a stop to, to threats, not to be a threat themselves. So we learn soon after that these two brothers had just lost their mom. Their, their younger brother took care of her until the end, but the older brother abandoned them for a long time even before he went to prison, because he couldn't bear to see his mom approach the end of her life like she did. We also learned that the older brother shot their dad because he was so violent, and that's why he went to prison. That had to have caused disastrous results between him, his brother, and his mom. Within the first 15 minutes, we understand how complicated these relationships just are. So they keep robbing banks, and the sheriff, like I said, is intuitive enough to 
<clears throat> to like a man. He's intuitive enough to know that they're, oh, they're raising a certain amount of money and it's gonna take a few banks to get there because they're just getting a little bit from this bank, a little bit from that bank. They're not robbing big numbers. They're just raising an amount over multiple banks. The two brothers stop at a diner and that's the movie. Nope. Tanner says, all right, I gotta go use the bathroom. He gets up and he goes across the street and robs a bank without Toby's knowledge or permission. I mean, this isn't a guy that asked for permission, so. Him doing this, they should have done it together. Him doing this sets the course of their plan and the rest of the movie into uncharted territory. It was not good that he did that because it gave the sheriff exactly what he needed for the chase. And then the sheriff gets this information immediately, which turns him around and sets him on the exact course that he needs to be on in order to catch them. Although, because only one man did it, it caused doubt for the sheriff. So he goes across the street to the diner that they were eating at and he talks to Jenny Ann, the waitress who was into Toby and got tipped like 200 bucks while Tanner was across the street robbing the bank. Toby thought he was using the bathroom and he was just talking to this waitress, kind of hamming it up with her. Jenny, the waitress, stands her ground and she does not give over the $200 that Toby left her as a tip. She argues, like, go get a warrant. This money is only evidence if they're the actual bank robbers. Until then, it's mine. You have to prove that the men who gave me this $200 tip are the bank robbers you're looking for. And if you can't prove that, then this money is innocent and I get to keep it. Little did she know. There's this scene at the gas station that comes pretty randomly, but I love it so much. Tanner is just sitting in the car, filling up with gas, and some hot rod pulls up right next to him, and Tanner just stares at the driver. And this makes the driver upset. He's like, what are you looking at, huh? <laughs> he ends up, the, the driver ends up pulling out a gun and flashing it, and going, what? What? And Tanner just sits there looking at him, not even worried at all. The guy holding the gun does not notice the other brother, Toby, coming out of the convenience store. And I love watching Chris Pine just come out of nowhere, like out of frame, and just ransacks the dude and beats him into oblivion, protecting his brother who, you know, could have gotten shot. But he gets into the car and he says to his older brother, dude, that guy could have killed you. And Tanner's response is, uh, not the way it would have gone, little brother. <laughs> Which makes me... Like, I wish I could see what would have happened because Tanner is so confident that even though the guy had his gun drawn already, that he could have taken him. And I believe it too, just based on what he said. <clears throat> it makes me wonder what he's capable of. So they go to the casino, these two brothers. Tanner is on the verge of causing a really big scene to throw them out. He thinks he's being protective of his little brother, but he's actually just being reckless with his little brother. And it's actually a really sad scene. Toby is about to, I mean, he's he's talking to a prostitute and he knows that, but he's still, like she touches him and you can tell that this is the first time he's really experiencing physical touch in this way in a long time. Tanner puts a stop to it and then ends up being the one to sleep with that prostitute. He didn't protect his little brother, he just cock blocked him and then stole the woman. And so that, that shows you that he's not loyal and protective of his younger brother in the same way that his younger brother is protective of him. After this, they cut people in on the deal and trade cars with the mechanics uh, to keep the police guessing so they get a new car. They also have a financier who thinks that they've won all this money at the casino. So he is helping them invest their money correctly and under the counter so it, it goes unnoticed. This movie reads Texas. How the dialogue is written, questions and responses are short to the point. People in this movie do not speak more than three or four sentences at a time. With some exceptions, but when Toby talks to his son about not following in his footsteps when he gets older, it's like a couple of words, a couple of words, a couple more words, and a couple more. I really like that. It, it's uh, Taylor Sheridan writes from how he speaks, I'm sure. The absence of the of the music stands out so vividly in this movie. 
allowing for the times that there are music to be really punctuated and effective. Some of the music they do is incredibly fun, especially when it matches what they put on screen, like the casino scene. I love the song and how the editing matches the song in that, in that whole montage. This is kind of the beginning of the end for the Howard brothers. One robbery that they do goes completely off the rails, in which a huge group of citizens all clearly have their license to carry firearms. They begin shooting and chasing the brothers out of town. Toby gets shot in the process, right in the torso, so the stakes have been elevated. This causes like a seven car chase scene until Tanner has had enough. He pulls to the side of the road and gets his full automatic weapon out and shoots at all like the seven or eight pickup trucks and, and drives them away with his, with his gun. He sends them driving tails tucked. That gets rid of them, but now they got a police pursuit. The sheriff doubted himself, but when they, when they hit the bank that he said that they would, it reaffirms to him that he does know what he's doing. He kept doubting himself, but he was intuitively right every time, and I love that aspect of this. The brothers have a beautifully simple final scene. In, in a way that two brothers in their 30s would do it, because they split off during the police pursuit. And they say, I love you to each other, and then they go, go fuck yourself. <laughs> and that's the last time that they see one another in this movie, or at all. Tanner lures the cops away. Toby takes off in another. He's still shot. He has to go take care of himself. He can only wish his brother luck as he drives himself to safety. And hopefully Tanner can escape the now cop chase. There's this one shot inside the truck as Tanner climbs up a hill. I love so much. He drives it up a hill and it's like loaded with a bunch of gasoline in the back of the truck. So he just uses the whole pickup truck as a weapon. He lights it on fire and lets it roll back down the hill and it explodes and, you know, stops stops the police pursuit. And then a good old fashioned shootout occurs. The sheriff knows immediately that this is a crazy guy. Tanner's at the top of the hill shooting with a sniper rifle, but there's no rhyme or reason to his shots. It's just chaos. It's just a chaotic shot. So he calls that right before Tanner snipes the sheriff's partner. Alberto, who he has just, just come to like in the story. It's such a sad scene. The, the sheriff can't even react. Like, he, he's dealing with his dead partner for like three or four seconds. His partner just got sniped in the forehead, and the sheriff goes, No. Get me up that hill. So the sheriff commandeers a truck and tells a citizen, Get me up on that hill right now. He's about to set up and do his own little bit of sniping, completely out of spite in avenging his partner. Calling back to the sheriff's line to Alberto earlier in the movie is something about, uh, you will be avenging me when I'm dead because I'm old. But it ends up being the opposite. Tanner has no idea that the sheriff has flanked him. Now he's come around the side and he keeps shooting. And then he has one final moment where he's just sitting up on that hill. He stops shooting and he just looks out on the horizon and admires the scenery. He doesn't know he's about to die. Right before the sheriff pulls the trigger, there's this high intensity to slow silence for Tanner's final moments. Like the calm inside the storm. The sheriff takes that shot and bam, Tanner's dead. The sheriff got him. The sheriff celebrates but also breaks down because now he's able to process the death of his partner and the death of this chase that he's just been doing for a week. Toby finds out later while he's sitting at a bar that his brother has just died. It's all over the news. Turning the mood into very somber. The music hits long and slow violins played with piano. It's really sad all around. Like two of the four main characters in this movie have just died. Toby does, however, leave with what he needed from the banks. He pays off the mortgage loan debt, and that's no longer hanging over his head. That was the whole goal of robbing the banks in the first place, was to pay that off, and he finally got it. Now he owns the land. The sheriff visits Toby, and they both recognize the fact that each of their partners ha has died in this whole debacle. And instead of dueling, dueling it out Texas style, 
there's this great scene. They literally have a Texas showdown. You know, like you would see in movies where it's like, wah, wah, wah. focus on the eyes, and then they draw their gun like that. You know, it's that type of showdown, but it's... It's for today. It's in modern day. So the sheriff is just sitting in his chair, little rocking chair, and Toby's standing up, and they both look at each other, and they get close-ups. <laughs> it's a great little Texas showdown. But they decide to make it a draw. They call it a truce, not to bother one another any further in any lawful vengeance or further criminal activity. So they're stopping both. They're not going to, the sheriff's not going to pursue them legally, and the and Toby is not going to rob any more banks. It's a very satisfying ending because Tanner was very toxic to Toby throughout the runtime. Even when Tanner says, <clears throat> this is a good thing that you're doing, Toby says back, we're doing this. And Tanner just looks at him. Tanner's not doing it for the right reasons. He's in it for the chaos. He's in it to rob banks and hurt people. His lack of a response tells me that his heart is not in the same place as Toby's. Tanner on his own would never be as selfless as to rob banks to pay off a mortgage. If he robbed banks on his own, he would go through the money so quickly and then he'd be back robbing banks. It would just be a cycle until he's put in prison again. So Tanner needed to die for Toby to break free of that bond and move on with his life, full of entirely better intentions. In the end, Toby and the sheriff refer to the death being peace continuing here on Earth will be what haunts them. So they threaten to give each other peace if they ever saw one another again. It's a very, very, very clever way to pull off a Texas standoff between these two modern-day cowboys. And then it's a cordial ending where by the end they just go, hey, if I see you again, I'm going to give you some peace. And the other guy says, not if I give it to you first. <laughs> Dude, I love this movie. It is unlike any other movie that exists. It is standalone, and I love when movies do that. This is, an, a, you know, an action drama movie, and how many times have we seen movies similar to this before? Heat, where people are robbing banks and, and you know, cops and robbers type of stuff. But this movie ends with... Peace. When do you ever see the movie, a conclusion, draw, like they call it a draw at the end, the bad guy and the good guy? And how often are you rooting for both parties the whole time? Not very often. So I genuinely love this movie. I love Taylor Sheridan for creating it, and I will watch just about anything Taylor Sheridan does. Anyways, yeah, thank you guys for being here and watching this. Hopefully I've, uh, you know, encourage you to go check out this movie again or more of Taylor Sheridan's work because the dude is a powerhouse in cinema and he's new. Th this movie came out in 2014, I think, 2015. So he's relatively new to making movies. But I also love that he's he's just returned to TV because Sons of Anarchy was, you know, a decade and a half ago. And now he's making this movie, uh, this uh, show, Yellowstone. It's so cool, man. Anyways, thank you guys for being here. Love you.